So joining our series for a rare and exclusive profile this morning is Mr. Shesh Gale, AM, co-founder and chief executive officer of the Melbourne Institute of Technology, renowned property developer and philanthropist. Shesh, great to have the opportunity to share your story on the program. I want to begin, if we could, with your upbringing in, in Nepal in a place called Lamjung. Tell us a little bit about your family. Uh, the district uh, in Nepal... Uh is called Lamjung. Okay, that's that's the whole of the district, which is Nepal has seventy seven districts, and in there um, a village uh, located on seven thousand uh, feet. Um, so beyond that, we don't have any inhabitants or any villages. That's the frontier to the north, to Tibetan border, if you like. So that's where I was brought up. Yes, so my mom, uh, she was there until yesterday. I think she returned yesterday. So she is 73 years old, but uh, she likes going um, to the village. And uh, um, every time she goes, she, she keeps saying, uh, this is my last trip. Uh, but I keep saying to her that don't, don't say that and uh, we'll have many, you will have many trips to the village. So she has that affection, you know, in the village and she says, oh, I, I have all kind of dues in the village. I have to pay this, to pay to this person, that person. And then uh, I feel, you know, she, she feels very happy when she does those things. So that's, that's the place. And uh, uh, of course, in the school, you know, attending the school, we had to, we had to walk a lot uh, from the house, um, like an hour or so. Uh, you know, even even you you just started this uh, class one, you're still a toddler, you know, but still you have to walk like that. That's 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 the kind of place uh, I used to live. Yeah. And what were you like as a student? Any any particular interests? Uh, as a student, um, yeah, we had to we had to cover all all the subjects, but uh, I liked everything like the geography, history, uh, and the maths and the science. Everything we had to we had to study. Then after primary school, um, <clears throat> I had to go uh, away from home uh, to another high school, where you know we had ha hardly handful of high schools uh, in that district, in the whole of the district. We had, I think, two or three high schools. So I had to leave home. Uh, I was, I think, 10 or 11 years old. So uh, leave on your own, you know, and uh, one day walk going to the high school. Uh, then, you know, we had, um, so that's the way I studied four years in high school. And take us through, you graduate from high school and you find yourself in the Ukraine studying engineering. How did all that come about? That's a long way. Um, I, I've never ever thought about that far when I was uh, studying uh, high school, which is uh, I completed high school. And then there, there, after then, there was another journey that you don't see beyond uh, uh, where are you going to study or what are you going to do because you are so much in, in a, that remote place. Then uh, studying further, meaning uh, you had to go to the capital city, which is Kathmandu, which I never ever, you know, I didn't even know, you know, and uh, uh, that was a, a new journey and uh, some 200 kilometers away uh, from from home. Um, then uh, that was uh, another, uh, if you like, adventure uh, because uh, we didn't have the finances, anything. My father, the farmer, you know, he didn't have any cash or anything or any idea. Just the one idea they had was somehow son needs to get educated. He needs to have a good education. That's the only idea they had. But how they didn't know, I didn't know. And so one year uh, I just lost because of finding out this, how working around where to go and how to go. So one year after the high school, I did a teaching job in my, in my school. So I was like a teacher. So exploratory year, if you like. So then there was a new, new journey and took a bus and arrived <coughs> to the capital city. 
and the, for the first time I had an experience of drinking a Coke on the route. So this is an interesting, uh, interesting thing. And then it was so bitter and so uh, untasty, I threw everything. <laughs> so, you know, can you imagine, I, I must have been 17 years old or something like that, or 16 or 17, and then experiencing a Coke. That's why I'm so fit uh, still, uh, you know, I didn't have too much of this bad stuff in my, in my system. <laughs> so, and uh, arrived at Kathmandu and uh, I had few people uh, that that um, guided me and uh, I stayed with somebody, then found out there is an engineering study you could do or, uh, or the health med medicine uh, to become a doctor or engineer. There are two, two, only two things in, in the mind of everybody, you know, a bright student to become a good student and then become an engineer or doctor, okay? That's the only choice you, you have, you know, those days. Then um, uh, I got selected in both both areas. Uh, then I, I happened to choose engineering. Then I studied two years diploma. Um, they used to call diploma in engineering. So there I found out if you are good, top 10 in the class among in, in, the, in the country, which is there was only one engineering studies college then if you can become one of the 10 top 10 students, then there is a scholarship, government scholarship that provided by Soviet, former Soviet Union to Nepal. So and then I found out then my goal was how to become the top 10 student. And then every semester I, I was top 10, a three or top four. So that was already pretty much, uh, you know, I, I clearly could see now that I can get the scholarship, which means my father, my parents, they do not have to contribute financially. By the way, when I had to study, while I was studying engineering, I got scholarship as well there. So there was not much uh, financial, uh, you know, help needed from home. Then my father came to the capital city once or many times. Once he, he lost in the city. So we were panicking and then eventually we found him. So, you know, all kind of uh, situations, incidents. So um, it's a long story, you know, when uh, I was studying in the high school, again, my father used to walk one whole day every month. He used to come with the, with the food ration we used to call the rice and all kind of things. I never needed any money. I didn't have money when I was studying in high school. We didn't, we didn't used to buy, there was no coffee or anything, of course. It used to be tea, uh, you know, but we, we never bought tea from the shop. So money was not required, okay? Food arrived from home every month. So we used to cook ourselves. That was my high school. I was just going back to high school. Then in, uh, in Kathmandu, I was uh, staying in a hostel. Um, then um, I, I quickly improvised how to adjust in the city from the mountains in the city. So um, after studying two years and I got scholarship, um, there was a hiccup a little bit and then one year delayed. Then I, I got a job after two years diploma. So I was working as well again. There was an interruption a little bit like between uh, the high school and studying diploma, I had one year interruption, then again another interruption. Uh, then finally I ended up in Russia, which used to be USSR, and then uh, we arrived in Moscow. Uh, then from there we were distributed, they allocate amongst 15 republics, of course these days 15 countries, you know, one of them. Uh, being Ukraine, and I feel so bad these days. The city where I was educated, I got education, everything was seemed to be perfect then. And uh, now, um, you know, totally destroyed and bombing as we speak now. And I got some friends, Russian uh, friends, they, they, they um, ran away from, from Ukraine and from, some in Greece or some in Cyprus. So I got in touch with them. I sent some money to help them just recently, last year alone. Uh, so I could not believe beyond our imagination those days, you know, this kind of thing, war between Russia and Ukraine. 
will ever happen, you know, nobody could imagine. But the, 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 this is the world we live in, right? And so uh, I studied six years, and then again, it took seven years because I got sick, and uh, seven years of studying in Russia, then I got master's degree in uh, civil engineering. That, uh, there was the government scholarship, so I had to come back to Nepal and serve the government. So that was the obligation. So I worked four years uh, as an engineer in Nepal. Uh, that was a whole lot of, uh, you know, completely diff different experience. Then I fulfilled my obligation to serve the country because they, they sent me uh, in scholarship. Um, then again, um, I got this turning point uh, in my mind. So uh, it was kind of fantastic, good job, everything. And all my friends, they enjoyed, and they're still working uh, in Nepal. Some of, most of them would have retired by now. <coughs> so I explored Australia. I just want to rewind there slightly to your experiences in Ukraine. I think you landed in 1979 there, and as you said, spent seven years completing your master's degree in around about 1986. What do you remember or recall most fondly of your time in, in Ukraine? Actually, first year I was in Odessa. It's a Black Sea, you know, uh, on, on, on Black Sea, the city. We, we often hear these days, Odessa, again the bombing there, okay? And Black Sea is a strategic place, of course, shared by Ukraine and now Russia, and predominantly used to be on, within the Ukraine Republic. So one year I spent in Odessa, uh, learning only Russian language one year. Then, uh, you know, one of the experiences that uh, I had was language is such a thing that if you are in the native environment and uh, if you are subjected to, uh, you know, forced to learn in that environment, within one year you become a perfect natural uh, native speaker. So. Uh, um, unlike English, because English I learned in Nepal, in the Nepalese environment, um, I can only uh, improve so much in English. But in Russian, I'm fluent, like like the native Russians, okay? So uh, we learned Russian language in Ukraine. Then from there, yet again, we were moved to Kharkiv. They call Ukrainian, they call Kharkiv, but those days in Russian, it's used to call Kharkov. So it's almost on the border of Eastern uh, bo uh, Russia, uh, Eastern Ukraine and the Rus Russia. So on the border town. So I spent six years there uh, studying, as I said before, engineering. Um, so um, we, we kind of enjoyed, you know, student life because everything was taken care of because of the scholarship. And uh, um, we, we really enjoyed uh, life because uh, in one hostel where you, we, we were accommodated, we had 60 different nationalities. And then those, those Soviet days, of course, the Eastern Bloc favored countries, or they wanted to influence those countries, developing countries, whether from Africa, like Syria, Lebanon, North, North Africa, and then like the countries of Caribbean and uh, South America, the Nicaragua, Cuba, and thousands of students used to used to go from Cuba, and then Afghanistan was under Russian control. Thousands from Afghanistan and you know the Vietnam and North Korea. So I have so much of these 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 experience now. The perspective, you know, those days, you know, uh, so it was good. As you said, you graduated in 86 and then spent the next three or four years back in Nepal working as a transport engineer for the Nepalese government. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is that where you met your wife or how did that partnership come about? That is another story. Uh, we had very, very early marriages and uh, um, that was before even I, I went to Russia, uh, which was when I completed my diploma. It's like year 12, you know, diploma was. So I was only 20 years old when I got married. She was, I think, 15 or uh, 16 or 17, 17, I think. Yes, that was in 78, 1978, long time ago. 
Then 1990 rolls around and you relocate to Australia. Just take us inside the decision to leave Nepal and, and why Australia? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> this, this was a uh, very quick decision, overnight decision. Um, uh, my um, engineering profession, uh, I was a site engineer uh, constructing highways in the mountains. Uh, I was responsible for uh, uh, constructing about 50 kilometers of mountain roads. And uh, uh, one night I, I thought, you know, um, uh, I had this something in my mind, uh, what I am doing, you know, um, I have to do something different. So doing different from engineering, the only way was to study uh, business uh, degree, uh, which is uh, MBA. So you could kind of leapfrog, uh, not doing undergraduate degrees straight to master's degrees, which is because of my pre-qualification in engineering, you could do still management in master's level. So I was exploring where to go, America or Australia. Uh, no, Australia was, wasn't in my mind. I, I was thinking of America. Then uh, there was an exhibition, Australian education exhibition in Kathmandu. Uh, then uh, my wife asked me, you, why don't you go and have a ch check, look? And then I, I went there and I found, I, I discovered Australia, if you like. Yeah, and I was very keen in geography. Therefore, I knew that uh, Australia uh, the fact that in 1956 there was an Olympics and uh, in Melbourne, so that was my, my in my knowledge, you know. And then I thought, um, so uh, let's try Melbourne. Yeah, that's how. And I, I did this overnight decision for the sake of doing something different, which is uh, to study management. So you enrolled in a Master of Business Administration degree at Victoria University, you graduate in, in 94. Take us inside your experiences studying business as opposed to working and having studied as, as an engineer. How different was it and did it light a, a fuse or a spark inside you to want to pursue a career in business? Um, that, that was interesting, again, uh, in, in, the, in being in the classroom, uh, we were the first uh, group of people, uh, uh, you know, uh, class doing MBA at Victoria University, not far from here. Again, uh, on the corner of, uh, you know, William and uh, Latrobe Street, in that uh, on Victoria University's MBA was run from there. So it's very dear to, to me, you know, I have, uh, you know, in this vicinity, that's at the moment, uh, living around here and, and working. So, um, the, we had a variety of students from various backgrounds and I was a very typical and probably less equipped amongst the students in terms of studying business. So I didn't know about any, any uh, like the share market or the marketing or finances, anything. Anything was new for me. So it was interesting for me and then I was very driven, very keen to learn. Uh, so, and some of the professors who, who taught me there and uh, they, um, you know, happened to be, I have been able to uh, bring them in, in, my, in my business, current business. And so uh, that's how we, uh, um, we're progressing, if you like. So it was in, everything was interesting for me. Yeah. I read that. During your time here in, in Melbourne in those initial years, you found that the educational experience in Australia and in particular in Victoria was obviously a lot different to the educational system over in Russia and some of the places that you'd studied. To what extent did you see your career heading towards a, a career in business or in, in education? Obviously you launched MIT in 96, but for those two years between graduation and 94 and the launch of, of MIT, what, where did you see your career headed? Um, actually, uh, I wasn't thinking uh, of doing business or enterprising or starting anything uh, while studying. 
only focus was where I'm going to get the job, you know, like engineering management, being engineer, engineer uh, engineering as my background. So having done some management studies, I was looking for a job in engineering management, project management or some sort. And not finding job was a lock, lock. If I found a job, I would have stuck there. And nevertheless, after doing MBA, I got a job in one of the uh, RTOs, they call RTOs these days, and those days as well, registered training provider, a, a private college. So uh, where predominantly they taught to international students. So I got a job to teach marketing based on my MBA degree. So uh, I got first time two years casual teaching. I took that job. At the same time, I was doing um, a housekeeping job in one of the five-star hotels in Melbourne. Still, I had my MBA already, so because you have to leave, you have to survive. I took a full-time job uh, doing housekeeping. Okay, I was very happy. I was the best performer there in that hotel as well. So very proud, very happy. I knew that I wasn't going to be forever doing that job. Uh, that's why uh, I perform well, you know, and uh, at the same time, I got this two hours job teaching, okay? So I took that. Then from there, and then uh, ultimately, they offered me full-time as a marketing manager for them. So going overseas and uh, sourcing students, international students, that's where I learned this about the business of education. So it was only one year, though. I had just one year. So I turned around that business, okay, who employed me, and I really appreciated. I was very enthusiastic to learn, but while I didn't confine myself, just doing the job what I was given to do as a marketing manager, I tried to learn insider of the business, how that operates as a private education provider. And I, I went above and beyond finding out how the business runs. Okay, that was not my job description as a marketing manager. Then of course the confidence was being able to see the source markets in overseas, going all around the places, attracting students for that college. So I turned around the business and then I brought lots of students from overseas and uh, I got excited. So I thought I did a great job and then I was looking for promotions and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Not, not that I was going to create another business or leaving the place. But then just before Christmas, after one year, I lost the job all of a sudden. And then they sold the business. So that's where the turning point was. Then um, I got really shocked, you know, losing the job. Every time I had all these shocks and uh, bad events, which subsequently turned in, out to be good, you know. So because I lost the job, my, my wife and I, we were discussing what to do. And then rather than finding another job somewhere else, and we thought, why can't we create one ourselves? That's where in 1996, early 1996, we registered a company and then uh, a few, in a few months' time, we got the license to operate. Um, uh, uh, an education entity. That's how we started. And that company, of course, is the Melbourne Institute of Technology, MIT Group. This is stages. Initially used to call something else, and then we thought this is not appropriate. And, you know, it's an evolution process. And start from a small thing and then step by step. Yeah. How did you go about building the business in those initial years? Um, Every time, you know, uh, you couldn't think of becoming big. And at the least, we didn't, we didn't think, we didn't have a big vision or big plan. Uh, in my case, at the least, you know, people say these days, you know, you have to have a big vision and big, you know, but uh, ours is different. We start small and then you, you step up, then you see a little bit more and then, you know, step by step, a very, very gradual process. Still, we're doing the same thing. We, we don't put too much big ambitions. We just do incremental basis. So, but early on, being able to identify and to, to be agile and 
transit from one to another level is important. That has been the track record. Um, within two years of operating, like uh, we call uh, vocational education, VET those days and today as well, there are thousands of VET providers within our industry. And those days as well, uh, but in the community like the Indians, uh, Nepalese and other diaspora communities, the newly arrived migrant communities, um, our thinking was in setting up an education business, it, the thinking was it is not possible. It's not doable thing, don't do that kind of thing, you know. But we did that against the odds, okay? Not having financial resources, again, that's important. But as we started operating, cash flows improved, everything, then we saw more. And within two, two years, we've identified vocational education or the offerings that the product, if you like, services you sell. Uh, that's, we shouldn't limit there, uh, or we have to choose, we have to transit from vocational to high, higher education. Then those, those days, uh, that was beyond imagination of anybody else, which we have imagined, saying that we shouldn't be staying there and also not mixing, not offering everything, just leave all together. And so the revenue generating uh, status or the business was vocational education, delivering diplomas. Then all of a sudden we made a decision, let's stop this, okay, not carry this and completely sell different products, which is higher education. Then those days there was no regulation, no scope that on your own you could offer higher education. But there was a way we found out that how do we do? Then we've, uh, we've uh, aligned, we've, we've built strategic relationship with the universities, then subcontracted their degrees and we started offering their degrees. Initially what we did from Edith Cowan University, Western Australia, we had to go so far because we couldn't find you know, uh, partners. So uh, we started delivering, within two years, we started delivering uh, ECU's degree programs out of Melbourne. Then on that process, we learned how to offer these degrees. That's a big deal, right? While we learned, then along the way came Federation University, we call these days, but those days you used to call Ballarat University, which is not far from here within the, within the state. So we've got a better partner, okay? So it's been, we, we still do Federation University programs. So uh, uh, this is, I think, our 20, 23rd year relationship. So with the relationship with the university, we le we're learning, you know, we, we have learned and then we're learning. Then the next stage was, okay, we're doing all these offerings, the degrees from the universities, why can't we do our own, okay? Then the regulation became a little favorable. Uh, government started allowing you, if you meet certain criteria, you could become on your own rights, uh, uh, higher education provider. So in 2004, which is we started to 1996, so 98, uh, vocational programs from 98, only higher education programs, but some other people's programs. Then in 2004, we got the, uh, we got the registration as a higher education provider. So it's, it's such a long, long journey. Education is such a thing that it takes, takes long, yeah. So you've spoken about some of the, the early challenges and some of the early opportunities that you encountered along the journey. Talk us through the past, say, decade or two from 2004 right up until 2023. How has MIT evolved both as a, as a business but also as an educa educational institution? Uh, obviously, of course, uh, MIT is the core business and my wife and I, uh, and, and among um, well, along with us, there are senior staff um, who have been very loyal, and then they have grown up, and they they with the with the with the organization. Um, uh, so we have been evolving, and we have been learning, and uh, maturing, and then reinvigorating. So uh, 2004, that was a turning point. We got the registration, and uh, since then we have. Uh, been developing uh, deeper and in terms of the breadth, three broader field of studies, business, IT, 
um, and uh, um, uh, the e-commerce and uh, recently uh, more of uh, data uh, and AI as we as we speak and uh, uh, as a technology uh, education provider um, uh, we have we, we are um, going into deep studies and offerings so uh, recently um, we have two degrees master's degrees which are research degrees one in ICT uh, and one in business so the, these are we um, there is only one um, higher education provider um, um, we became the second to offer this research degrees so we just recently hired a research uh, a director of research degrees. So uh, at the moment, MIT is uh, on the process of more into uh, research, um, you know, uh, deep degrees in uh, in uh, in IT. Um, so uh, that is the, that is where MIT is, and also we have uh, put an application with the regulator, which is Texas Tertiary Education Agency. Uh, to become a partially self-accrediting institute, uh, that would mean if we get that, that means that would mean like like universities. Whilst we don't have the university title, uh, but uh, um, our systems uh, will be trusted in such a way by the regulator that you could accredit your programs on your own. Uh, if you like, you could validate your programs on your own. So in higher education, um, we, any program we, we develop, it needs to be registered by the, by the regulator. And so that is little um, inefficient way of in today's market. And if you like the products and services, anything you, you, you develop as per the market needs, uh, that doesn't last long, so uh, but with the regulator it takes years to to develop. But if we can get the self accrediting uh, authority, then you become more competitive in the marketplace. So that's where MIT is, and our aspiration is, of course, in next five years time to become a university college, uh, which is not a full blown university, but university college is such a uh, level criteria that uh, Australian government has frameworked a few years ago that categorize as, uh, um, you know, um, high, one of the higher education uh, uh, criteria that Australia has provisioned, which is, which is great. You know, over the time I have seen in my lifetime of this business lifetime that how Australian education system bringing, allowing private investors or people uh, beyond public sphere that you have a level playing field. If you want to become uh, or invest in education, you, you could have all these things, which is 20 years ago, there was non-existence. So system need to allow you, actually, regulators need to allow you how to operate. That is very important and we are very proud that we have that. But I have done uh, studies of America, uh, Canada, and uh, particularly uh, <coughs> uh, in England, uh, but uh, n no such thing uh, in, in those countries, which is great. Australia has this opportunity, uh, the system allows. That's why uh, we, we could, we could uh, aim for becoming uh, like that. And it's good for the community because there will be competitive forces and then this will uh, uh, give other existing public universities to become more efficient because they will feel competition. And for us as well, and then we, we compete with the universities. And these days, MIT is in such a level, um, not every university, I'm not talking about G8 or anything, high-ranking universities, but some of the lower ranking or mid ranking universities they are our competitors which is which is great and uh, we we put ourselves one of them like one of them we don't look down we look up before we move on i want to ask you in such a competitive marketplace clearly you've built a, a powerhouse business here in mit how have you remained 
uh, competitive and, and at the forefront of the education sector? Uh, one of the things is our agility. We're very agile. Uh, we are small, uh, we are very small, uh, but we are agile and particularly, uh, you know, after post-COVID, uh, in, in such a technological environment, um, we can move fast and very competitive and then our competitive advantage is we know them uh, quicker than anybody else in the marketplace globally because we compete globally our source markets are those markets where uh, particularly english speaking countries like uh, uh, britain uh, canada america australia these are the four countries who uh, who compete in international uh, education uh, source markets so uh, mit in that mix uh, we sense quickly, uh, we have a, like, as an example, we have an office in India, regional uh, global uh, uh, marketing office, where we have about 50 staff, and then day-to-day uh, -day events. Day-to-day, -day, uh, we, we, we work on a daily basis, uh, not, not even month or year, you know, the, in the bigger universities, the data and flowing through those things, very time consuming, but we are prompt. One of the successful elements is we are prompt, then we quickly design programs as per the market needs. So that is one of the success elements, I think. Uh, uh, and also MIT's fundamental uh, thinking is not uh, EBIT driven, okay, not not uh, revenue or the profit driven. Uh, it's education is a different different kind of business. Sometimes I feel like uh, we shouldn't be calling uh, business, okay. But you need to sustain uh, to to invest and to improve. You need to have the revenues. You need to have uh, good good profit margins as well. So uh, that's how. Yeah. How have you managed the financial roller coaster of being able to navigate events like COVID and the GFC in, in an environment which is can be quite volatile with student numbers, particularly international student numbers, fluctuating? Um, I have seen last 25 years, you know, and the internal and external factors like the government's uh, uh, population policy, immigration policies, all, all directly linked with the with the education, okay, um, and then um, global uh, environment, um, the, uh, in those countries, source countries, and particularly now, uh, GFC was lesser uh, impact on education, uh, but COVID was a direct impact, most impacted, uh, adversely impacted industries because the borders were closed three years. We had to sustain. Um, MIT still uh, still uh, made smaller uh, profits um, in those even uh, lockdown periods, and if that was beyond uh, more more uh, more than three years, then we wouldn't have sustained. Uh, but three years we we withstand, and now uh, well and truly we have recovered. Uh, but it is it is a slow recovery, unlike uh, all the media and everybody else saying and so many students arrived and this and that, but uh, uh, in MIT, we haven't felt that way. Uh, but uh, we don't consider any risks such that your business will collapse or anything. It's not like that, okay? But uh, pre getting to pre-COVID levels, I think we'll, we'll need another year or so, yeah. So that's the educational aspect of your career. Let's now talk about the, the property aspect. You had a lot of foresight to invest in commercial property here in Melbourne since the early days. Talk us through your property journey. What, what made you invest in commercial real estate way back in the 90s? Yes, and uh, commercials, uh, as you know, um, these days is a lot of bashing, right? <laughs> and and uh, uh, even even scary to 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 talk. But uh, um, our our focus has been Melbourne, and then uh, some extent uh, uh, Sydney. Uh, then Sydney became too expensive, so we couldn't expand much. Then we went away uh, overseas, and we have some uh, investments in overseas as well. But predominantly Melbourne. Uh, how we started? Because 
being in the city and we needed a decent uh, accommodation for our own operation. That has been driver number one, which is, which is making us now fending off all these uh, fluctuations of uh, the uh, office market. And so I am not exposed as such in the office, but my office is uh, Education Institute, which is at the moment uh, uh, up, upward trajectory. Uh, so in that way, um, a little, uh, uh, you know, uh, saved, I, I guess. Uh, but uh, in terms of the valuation and everything, of course, uh, uh, that's another element. But we, we don't turn around much and we, we buy uh, and then we hold and for a long term. So I, I am, if you like, a very long term player. And I have certain tests within the city of Melbourne, even in Sydney, we like the heritage buildings. Now, often I see some, some things uh, I read, uh, which gives me a real pleasure that, uh, uh, like the social values, okay, they talk about Sydney Opera House the other day, they were talking about 14 billion, uh, worth $14 billion, okay, because of social elements. Then I just thought, what about Argus, you know? Argus building, is, it has quite a social value, you know? And so is Charles Hotham, uh, you know, uh, building which has full of histories. I like preserving those, you know? And because Argus was the most difficult uh, project we did successfully, I'm very proud of this and then uh, being able to uh, to return the building, uh, the site into formal glory so that the you know, intrinsic value of the city of Melbourne, uh, I believe uh, in a smaller uh, size, I have been able to contribute. So will be Charles Hotham because uh, I always get offers like you, if you're selling this much and that much, I'm waiting planning permit to, to improve that uh, um, that site that will be uh, done and then some of the smaller uh, you know commercial properties which are uh, okay because of the location within the city as well certain locate I think we are very patchy at the moment unlike three years ago anything would have been can could have sold in Melbourne anything and then anything would have a skyrocketing price but now I think I'm observing it's very patchy like the northern part, you know, along Elizabeth Street, Queen Victoria Market, it's it's booming at the moment because of student population, student, okay? People, if you live 24 seven, then that gives a vibrancy and then you need lots of services and the retailers doing fine, that's great. So um, I think I'm just, I just feel that it's lucky escape and in current environment. But how we started was first foray was in 2002, we bought a property in Burke Street. I just recently sold, uh, which is almost in the mall. That was the first time in auction. It was a scary and uh, being with the commercial players. So that 2002, can you believe 2002 you bought and you just sold now, okay? So 20 years, more than 20 years we have retained. So I don't do too much turnaround, but one of the properties which I regret is Thomas Shetty House, again with a character, with the heritage, everything. Because I st we, we operated business nine years there, we have that affection. So I, I just only regret, I shouldn't have sell that, <laughs> you know. That's the only, only building that uh, I bought and I sold. Uh, other than that, uh, I'm pretty much uh, sitting well, yeah. I think it was a um, it was an asset that was purchased by Justin Hems out of Sydney, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm sure it, uh, its legacy will live on. As you said, there's been a number of deals: Thomas Eddy House, the Argus Building, Sir Charles Hotham Building, and and more. What do you look for? What are the fundamentals that you look for prior to investing? So you like heritage buildings, what areas of the city, and and what what are the other elements that you look for? Uh, one of the major sites which we have bought in 2009 that was during GFC, uh, that, uh, that is uh, Old Mazda site, which is uh, underdeveloped at the moment, which is one acre uh, in, on William uh, and Franklin Corner, overlooks Flagstaff Garden. 
So uh, it was so cheap then and we just happened to purchase and I, I feel like uh, I could hold that indefinitely because $15 million I paid for that and then I, I, I get every, every day before COVID and during COVID and even now in excess of 100 mil. So I'm just holding and then that has been forever development. And uh, we, to be honest, we spent so much money in, uh, in, in reworking and uh, restarting and doing so. Uh, we haven't yet decided, but we were just about to ground break a uh, few months ago. So we have put kind of on hold at the moment, but uh, all the works going at the moment, the works being very time consuming and expensive are the site works. Uh, like uh, archaeological last one year we're going through that and we've we uncovering all kind of things uh, in that site and like even we found out that uh, our first Lord Mayor of Melbourne's residence in that site okay which we never no, nobody could imagine that was 1800s so that site is being uh, archaeology is going then the heritage dealing with the heritage facade again happened to be I didn't want I mean I was looking for beautiful heritage buildings but that was the ugliest thing but then at the end they put heritage on that as well so I am not escaping any heritage you know and the facade needed to to retain it's, it it doesn't look good though but must be something there so happy to hold that so or oh, preserve that so uh, we're dealing with that heritage there and on a, on a side of one acre uh, and land lease is developing that the city, with the city of Melbourne Hughes as you have seen uh, on, on media that uh, uh, you know one just under two billion dollars project and the city of Melbourne's that uh, the Victoria uh, Plaza you know uh, on the existing car park the whole of the Queen Victoria develop market development uh, will bring vibrancy in that precinct. So uh, uh, my site is going to be very relevant, uh, whatever we do. Now we are thinking of, uh, we don't know, uh, we, we're just about to, to do a five-star hotel and now uh, an office, 23,000 net level, net level um, six-star, green star, and with all the elements of carbon neutrality, every sustainability elements, we were doing that. But because of the cost blew out of, you know, unaffordable at the moment. And then just thought, what are you going to do? You know, the office, okay? People not coming in the city three days only. And uh, are you going mad or something? Uh, are you really going to do this office and create another problem? Uh, or student accommodation is, is a boom now, right? And then what to do? Yet again, you know, initially we, we had the apartments and then we had a hotel. Then we changed. It took two years and how much we spent, the consultants and everything. And we got permit and everything, office and five-star hotel. Now, how to turn, uh, change that office into BTR, or, you know, there's a new term, BTR, and or, uh, you know, purpose build student accommodation. Student accommodation is logical because MIT needs, we've got like 2,500 students at the moment in this building, okay? Or oh, MIT campus, I, I, I don't know, but uh, I'm comfortable here at, on, uh, at the Argus, but, um, maybe a, a sustainable campus. This is the recent thinking, you know. Um, uh, so, uh, but I've got various options, you know, and that's sitting well, and then uh, I don't mind doing, uh, doing things, you know, whatever need to do, which is uh, dealing with the heritage and uh, archeological, everything enabling work going on at the moment. So uh, that could be uh, student accommodation, a combination of the hotel um, or with a, uh, such a issue of housing, um, uh, maybe BTR project. So, but we're not thinking of selling or anything um, at the moment, still holding. Uh, so kind of undecided situation, um, but we can hold, uh, we, can, we can keep.
So it's because we, we are long-term uh, people. Who knows, in two years' time, maybe everybody else comes to office and uh, Melbourne City needs uh, more office space. So, yeah. I want to ask, just when you're analysing a development opportunity or an investment opportunity, what do you look for when you look at risk? What are the key inputs that you evaluate when it comes to risk? Um, one of the things is borrowings, okay, using other people's money. So my wife and I, we are very risk averse. And uh, like MIT, uh, we don't borrow uh, anything, you know. Uh, but within the group property, of course, you know, and uh, without having the funding or uh, facilities, it's, it's difficult to grow. You're stuck, you know. So kind of we are in that uh, territory at the moment. So it's scary to borrow, you know, very expensive at the moment, and you, you don't know where that is heading. That gives you uncertainty. Uh, so because of our... Uh, uh, ap not being uh, appetite, yeah. and then then we don't want to uh, gear too much, and then that ultimately impacts on MIT's operations. Uh, so anything we do is with our internal uh, funds. So that's that's the nature of uh, our 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 business. And then I have I have overseas developments which. I, we have to we have to complete that uh, that's in uh, on an in, uh, you know completion stages which is fully uh, funded internally uh, so because of all those dynamics um, I kind of this is the core business education is core business okay but still have to keep learning and then focus that is the thing I think I couldn't uh, probably my attention couldn't have divided in terms of going in an aggressive manner in terms of commercial property development aspect of the thing. So uh, whilst I keep abreast of developments, uh, I get little concern, so I couldn't be too, too aggressive. And we don't like JBs as well, uh, joint venturing, and uh, so we are kind of on our own focus, people, yeah. It must be said that you've obviously got holdings here in Melbourne, you've got a property in Sussex Street in Sydney, but then there's assets overseas and, as well. One of the assets in particular that I want to ask you about is Sheraton Kathmandu. Take us inside how that opportunity came about and, and why you were so passionate about giving something back and, and building a hotel in the area. Uh, sure. Uh, the investment in, in Nepal, that... Uh, uh, again um, has been a little opportunistic as well as uh, kind of giving back to, to Nepal as well and socially um, focused. Um, but the way that we have invested is foreign direct investment from Australia to Nepal. Actually, it hasn't been brought in the, in the too much of in highlights, but uh, that is the, the largest investment, Australian investment in Nepal, uh, which is at the moment $100 million uh, we have invested. And in 2008, uh, we found a prime land and very cheaply. So we took that opportunity. So it's believed to be uh, tens of times now uh, more expensive. Uh, so uh, we thought in such a good, good uh, land, uh, we should build something quality which was driven by quality development. And then that has become a never ending journey because of uh, local circumstances. Then there was an earthquake. It was shaken all the foundations, everything. We had to redesign, redo again. And at the moment, that is the landmark structure in Kathmandu, the tallest building. And then that's oversees everything. Um, so, uh, uh, we going through um, the brand initially we thought Sheraton Hotel but as we speak now that is evolving as well so we are uh, considering of higher brand more luxu luxurious brand than Sheraton uh, probably we're looking for seasons or the likes of the brand so it will be finished in within a year or 18 months so uh, 
very much focus on um, hospitality and FNB, um, that country and lots of events happens in Nepal. So I think we did we did a good diversification there because the asset in terms of the value has grown tens of folds. So that, that has been great. And we have done smaller investments in Europe. They're also doing, doing fine. So um, next stage we're looking is something more social enterprising, um, also the charitable things that we're doing a few things, yeah. I thought we'd close out our discussion with a few more general items. I want to get a sense of Shesh Gale, the person. What what motivates you or what inspires you every day? Um, I think uh, the two things here is, is I'm not alone. And uh, my wife there, she, she is more even uh, equipped and ever learning, you know, and uh, very optimistic, full of enthusiasm, that also drags me. Sometimes I go down and she brings me up, and then sometimes if she goes down, uh, occasionally I, I, uh, I happen to bring down, motivate her as well. So combination goes very well. Uh, it's a very unique situation that uh, two persons, and she's more on focus on operation of MIT, uh, that gives you more opportunity and time to go away and do something else as well. So we are exploring at the moment in terms of uh, climate mitigation strategies in Nepal or some of such as via green hydrogen because Nepal has a huge potential of uh, hydroelectricity. So the converting, utilizing hydroelectricity and producing uh, chemical fertilizers, green fertilizers, so that uh, by uh, hydrogen and ammonia. So that last one and a half years we have been exploring, which is not like globally everywhere else. It's not commercially uh, viable uh, option as a hydrogen as an energy on an energy transition landscape. But nevertheless, like everybody else, we are we are learning there and a lot of agencies, international agencies like the World Bank and the like ADB um, who are very keen to help Nepal in terms of climate mitigation and uh, we are, uh, MIT Group Holding is leading the charge in that area. So we will see, this is a long journey, uh, but something, a social enterprise, you know, um, uh, those, those are the areas that a small steps again there uh, we're looking yeah it's a remarkable story from humble beginnings to a billionaire here in australia what have been the keys to your success and, and jamuna's success as well i think this is the learning everyday learning uh, not stopping the new things happen and then within your industry as well as beyond just keep learning uh, and be hopeful and optimistic. Again, anything you do and uh, uh, start from a small steps. Yeah, from there. That's that's the way it has been. How have you been able to overcome challenges in your life, whether they're personal or professional challenges? I think Along the way, always uh, you have the turning points, and uh, you have the you come across difficulties, um, and then but if you if you keep, um, you know, learning and uh, um, keep few options, uh, when you fail, then you you choose your uh, use your alternatives and options. Then, I think you more or less. Uh, yeah, become successful, yeah. In terms of your philosophy or, or your outlook on life, how would you describe or define that? In terms of outlook, you know that COVID, during COVID times, we had lots of reflections and lots of thinkings. Uh, so that was the most challenging time. Uh, so uh, you learned a lot and uh, and because the perspective where where you come from and how you brought up, um, 
during COVID times, we, we had one, one time we, we thought if, if everything, you, you, what you have created goes down, then you still have something in your village, in the mountains, you can still go there and then uh, do some farming and, and leave. So that's the perspective we, we thought, but we don't think now that way. Uh, because we 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 think that like everybody else, there won't be another COVID in your in our lifetimes. But who knows what? But but because of that perspective, you know how down you can you can go, you can cope. Um, so you have nothing to lose, kind of thing. Uh, but we don't take that much risk these days, you know, um, because you don't want to waste or lose whatever you have created. You want to utilize that to some for some good. Uh, good for the society, for the community. So our thinking is more towards, uh, you know, the social enterprise and through the foundation. And uh, that, that's where uh, most of the things left to work. Yeah. Final question. What are your proudest achievements? So the proudest achievement? Um, it's no such thing that one event or anything yeah, anything you improve along the journey. Um, I think getting to education was the proudest achievement. You know, along the journey, you studied and then you never stopped. And then getting involved in education business, if you like, you know, education entity, that's that's the proudest thing. I think this this institute will will remain for for many years, you know, even after our life. So that's that's a thing, lasting thing. It's not like any other business or real estate or anything, but Education Institute is a yeah, very sustainable thing for the for the community. Yeah. Shesh Gal, I, I am privileged to have the opportunity to share your story and share your insights. Thanks for your time. So much, and uh, I haven't spoken for many years. So giving me this opportunity and sharing my experience with you, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, Rob.